Welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination, Season 1, Episode 5. So I'm passing math today, which is good because I'm going to talk with a techie and uh, she'd check my math. I, uh, I'm so glad to be back with you and really excited about today's guest. I'm also excited that this week I got my COVID, or last week Thursday, I got my COVID vaccine dose two of the Pfizer, and I know many of us across the country are kind of excited about making progress against the pandemic. My only side effect was, a side effect was I felt a little crummy and felt like taking a nap, and 13 hours later, I was fine. So I got the best nap in, in my life, probably. So let's hope that society progresses uh, down the vaccine trail and we overcome this uh, really tragic uh, situation. I do want to thank, before I start, Think Tech Hawaii for allowing me to present Pigments, the Power of Imagination. They're a 5013C corporation, which I think means they need your donations. I know they do. So help out Think Tank. They've got a, a tremendous diversity of, of content and they rely on you, the viewers, to support them. So please do. I have a great guest today. I'm really excited about having Lieutenant General Susan Helms on an old friend from my time at Air Force Space Command. And uh, Susan, how are you? Bring, bring it. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Big. It's great to see you again. Likewise. Uh, so you were in the first Air Force Academy class with women. I couldn't even get into the Air Force Academy. In fact, I think they might still stop me at the gate. Uh, you were a flight test engineer. You were the first military woman in space. You were a three-star general, the longest spacewalk. Holy cow. And that doesn't even cover your most difficult assignment in the Air Force. I think I know what you're going to say. It yeah, has to you had, with teaching this three star at Space Command. Yeah, you had to teach me about space. You and Colonel Marty France, another great Space Command officer, got stuck with teaching the Neanderthal fighter pilot about space and how stuff works in space. What do you remember about that? Just because it had to be your most difficult job. Uh, I remember how quick of a student you were. I I remember <laughs> really thinking when I explain space to a lot of people, it, it does sometimes take a while for folks to catch on if they're not familiar with the material, but you caught on immediately. And not only did you catch on to the physics that were going on, but you also caught on to the implications of what military space would really bring to the fight. And that's what well, I remember about that half hour, I think, I spent in your office with a chalkboard and a piece of chalk. And, uh, and a few hand gestures and things yeah, like we, that, right? We don't, we don't do this. We, we <laughs> do this, the blog. Exactly. Uh, well, you and Marty did a great job. And I was, if I was quick, it was because I was passionate about it because I never flew a combat mission. It was the F-15 and F-16 combat missions I flew that wasn't very much enabled by space capabilities. So, so I was passionate about it. I don't know if I told you my shuttle launch story at the time. Uh, I shared this right before we came on the air, but, but uh, my earliest exposure to space was when I had a chance to see a shuttle launch and didn't. And in preparing for this, I think you might have been on that mission in uh, Discovery Mission in 1994. But as a group commander, I was down at the um, shuttle landing strip, right, at Patrick Air Force Base. And uh, I went there to meet with one of my squadron commanders who had a helicopter squadron that supported shuttle landings. And um, there was a delay. Was there a delay on every launch you ever flew on? No. Or I you know, that one was really interesting because we didn't think we were going to launch that day either. But nonetheless, yes. they thought, well, just in, just in case the weather breaks, let's load you all into the spacecraft. So we woke up that day thinking there's no way. I mean, the weather was terrible that day. And our window for launch was about two and a half hours. Um, so at the two hour and 10 minute point, so we had 20 more minutes left to go, mission control and launch control came on and said, hey, we got a break in the weather, you're going now. 
So yeah. we literally had, we had to mentally switch our heads from today's not a day we're going to launch to we're launching now. And it going was really space. about that quick. And well, uh, all, I was all of my not missions that went on time. I'm sorry, go ahead. Really? All of your other missions went on time? I was not that quick, Susan, because uh, Bob Holloway, my 41st Rescue Squadron Commander, and I were sitting in the blockhouse there at the Latting Strip, if you remember that. Yep. And just having a great kind of father-son, I'm his boss conversation. Uh, he's a fine squadron commander. And we heard this noise and went, what do you suppose that is? Well, that is the motor starting on the shuttle. And we run outside like a couple of idiots, which we were. And I look up and I, I swear, Susan, I saw this contrail that went up to a cloud and disappeared behind a cloud. And because of the geometry, I never saw the shuttle. Who else can do that? So. Well, we were almost as surprised as you were. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to participate. I didn't. That's so, true. That's true. What is, you know, with all of your experience, and we'll get to the longest spacewalk in history, which you owner of, of that um, accolade, if you will. Um, but if you were to tell the general public, our viewers, one thing about being in space, operating in space, being an astronaut, that you'd like them to know, what would it be? I would like people to know how peaceful life is up there mm -hmm. on the space station. I, you know, when I was in space in 2001, that was my last mission. It was a, a six month duration flight on the International Space Station. And people often ask me, um, what, what were you scared all the time? Was it nerve wracking? And I tell people, no, actually it was kind of the most peaceful time of my life. Uh, yeah. Because we were away from almost all email, all phone mail, all that noise of life. We didn't have television. We didn't have any kind of, you know, social media, of course, back then Thank in 2001. And, and it was peaceful. And it was so peaceful that when I came back from that six month mission, the most difficult transition to make after being in space for six months was getting used to all the noise of life again. Which, hmm. which I did not expect. And no yeah. one told me about that in advance, but it was a very difficult transition psychologically to come back from a long duration space flight and be around people again. Um, I wow. was with a crew of three people total, uh, me and a Russian and another American. And, and um, all three of us were, um, it, that was a tough transition actually. More tough and than the physical transition to come back from space. Did, did you speak Russian or English? During that. Uh, we spoke Bruce Lish. Uh, Jim <laughs> and I, Jim Voss, my spacewalking crewmate, uh, yep. he and I had to learn how to speak Russian because half of the space station at that time is Russian provided. Right. And Yuri Usachov, our crew commander, had to learn how to speak English. So between the three of us, over four years of training and then six months on the space station, we just kind of came up with our own little crew language of Bruce Lish. And it worked extremely well. We understood each other pretty much perfectly, even awesome. if people around us couldn't understand us. So that six month mission you trained for four, four years for? Yeah, I think that's, I think that was the number. It, so I started wow. in 97 and we launched in, um, on March 8th of 2001, we just had our 20th anniversary um, wow. a couple weeks ago. So our peaceful is, or our takeaway about space is it's peaceful. Yes. It's shocking and beautiful. beautiful and beautiful i've seen that in but only in pictures and you know maybe i've flown fairly high but not like space so how does somebody like you wind up in space what was your motivation and of course i'm answering asking questions i know the answer to because i know your dad if we could see the picture of your dad was right. a key part of your motivation and let me talk about technology. That's an IBM Selectric typewriter, I think. A beautiful I, I think so bit too. of technology at, at the time. Um, for those of us who had to type term papers and stuff. But so your dad, I know, was your motivation. Tell me about, about that and how he inspired you, because we're about entertaining and inspiring here on Fitness. Yes. So 
you know, my, my parents, of course, were really awesome. My dad was a career pilot in the Air Force, and he had flown in several different kinds of airplanes. Um, and I think that as I looked at what he did in the Air Force, there was so much about what his life was like and what his career was like that was really um, inspiring to me, you know, serving his country. Mm -hmm. Of course, he spent a year in Vietnam. Um, in addition to that, it was a really, it was really compelling to me to travel around. It was compelling to me to move often and see different places and get a chance to travel. Of wow. course, I didn't realize at the time how far I would travel, <laughs> but- uh, Further than me. Yeah, so the Air Force offered lots and lots of opportunities to do some really amazing things while you're serving your country. And um, and then on top of that, in the 70s, you know, for me to join the Air Force, I would get equal pay for equal work. That was another motivator uh -huh. back in the 70s, because there weren't a Did, whole lot of places where you could do that. As a young lady, woman, did that give you a bit of an edge? Did, you know, was there a little bit of you know, was that something you really wanted? Equal pay for equal work? That yeah, you I, thought think, about? I think actually my dad and my mom both um, were always very supportive. So for them, yeah, they my mom and dad both were of the mind that there, there was nothing I couldn't do if I didn't put my mind to it. So if I would yeah. just put my mind to something, I could make it happen. And they both believed that. And uh, I grew up in a family of daughters. I, I don't know if I um, find that a compelling fact or not, but I was the oldest of four daughters. Oh, and, uh, and, it, and my parents just absolutely made sure that if there was something I was interested in doing, they would ensure that I would understand that was achievable. And I loved math and science as a kid. And I decided I wanted to get into something that was math and yeah. science related which was where the idea of becoming an engineer came from, since it's also a creative career. Yeah. Well, you're also an artist and a, a pianist, I think, and yes. a musician. And you told me that uh, one of your mentors, some somebody uh, told, told you that the best way to be creative was to be an engineer, something like that. I yeah. got that right? If, if you like math and science and you also wanna be creative, the engineering career field is a great way to go because well, it's well, by I, its inherent um, nature, design is part of the creative process with math and science. And I am uh, wearing my Uni University of Hawaii uh, shirt today in honor of Alejo. Some of you know him, some of you viewers who was admitted to UH this week. But when I shared that with him, he's an artist and musician um, he said, yeah, it's a logical path to creativity. I really like that description. I can't do it. I hate math and science. I have no musical talent. I just wanted to fly. But as it turns out, you kind of just wanted to fly too. And we'll get back to that right after we talk about our coming episodes, okay? Sounds good. So um, in our next episode, uh, Eric, there we go. We're going to have Andre and Maria Jacquemantan, who are tremendous friends. I've mentioned them for several weeks now, lead writers for the first several years of Mad Men, and they take their figments and sell them. And uh, I've worked with them and ha have gotten to know them. Folks, you're going to love this. You're going to love the inside Hollywood look at it, and you're going to really enjoy meeting two wonderful friends of mine. And then um, two weeks after that, we'll meet with Kim Rowley and Bruce Fink, who both were told, basically, you're going to die, and decided their pigment was to not die. Now, it doesn't always have that happy ending, but Kim and, and uh, Bruce are going to share their stories, and I know you'll be inspired by that. And by the way, Kim, her husband, Ross, who I try to take money from on the golf course every week, and Susan all taught at the Air Force Academy together and have recently met again on vacation, right, Susan? That's right. I just got back yeah. from Texas where I met up with them for a spring break. It wasn't traditional spring break. It was in a bubble, but um, yeah. we had a great time. And, and I think Ross said he was going to take your money. So I'll whatever, just warn you whatever. about that. Whatever. Um, it is a small world, and you've seen it from a perspective where it's a real small world. 
but you wanted to fly, right? I mean, that's what you really wanted to do. And I know that feeling. So tell me about how you felt about flying and getting in the air. Yeah, I, I, when I was a, a test engineer, it, it became obvious that flying high and fast was, it's one of those things where you wake up every day going, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. Yeah, uh, I'm do. doing engineering while I'm in the air on the jet, but to get to fly while I'm doing what I love all at once was really uh, like living in Disneyland actually. Uh, so when the astronaut opportunity came along, uh, people would say, well, you know, what is it about being an astronaut that really appeals to you? And I said, well, I get to fly higher and faster than I've ever flown before. And I get to see a beautiful view at the same time. So I must have something about my dad inside of me because yeah. he loved to fly. And, um, and I'm the only daughter that has taken this path. Uh, but nonetheless, just flying high and fast and and of course, you know, it's kind of hard to beat the space shuttle uh, for, you know, a rocket ride. That's but you don't just wind up, you don't just say, you know, I want to get on the space shuttle. You've got to pay some dues. And you put your living where your mouth was and said after test pilot school. And uh, so Susan viewers went to test pilot school as a flight test engineer and then chose to go to cold lake canada and from honolulu that sounds crazy we have a picture that i shiver when that's you on a canadian cf-18 hornet getting ready but that's cold man I, that's probably june right june or july at cold lake oh probably so, it probably, yeah, but it probably you, is but man you, the flying was great the up fly. there yeah. that, and that's you flew in CF-18s and their version of the T-33, I think. What else? Uh, F-5s. Uh, and then they had Kiowas and uh, twin-engine Hueys. And then they had a, a Canadian unique airplane called the Challenger that I never saw fly because it was having <laughs> issues the whole time it was I was up there. Having challenges, I guess. Yes. It was, um, um, but yeah, it was the F-18 and the F-5 were obviously two of my top favorites, but they let us fly in everything, which wasn't necessarily true at Edwards or Eglin. You had to pick a weapon system. Right, but right. Canada, and as you, as you know, I've got a son-in-law who's an Air Force test pilot. You do have to focus in your job. Um, you went to Cold Lake. Right. And, and then uh, you met some people and saw movies, and that made you want to be an astronaut beyond what we've already talked about, higher and faster. Right. You met folks who'd flown in space and yes i met sally ride in grad school um kind of a jaw-dropping moment to get a uh, grad to school while in the air force by the way folks while in the so air force yes the air force sent me to grad school and sally ride came through there and gave a speech and i went up to her and i was so stunned to meet her that i couldn't even talk um yeah. and then i also met uh, Dick Covey, he came to our graduation for test pilot school. He was a graduation speaker. Mm -hmm. And um, and he encouraged me uh, to apply for the astronaut program. He basically said, oh, we hope we see you in Houston sometime, which is where all the astronauts live and train. And, um, and I also had been primed by watching a couple of IMAX films. Uh, one of them in particular, The Dream is Alive, narrated by Walter Cronkite. And, um, and that movie was something you saw in an IMAX theater. It still yep. plays, you mm -hmm. can get it on DVD if you want. And it is uh, a real stunner. And, and when I looked out the window, the first moments- we got a I picture of you space, looking out the window. When I, when I looked out the window the first moments, the first thing I said, according to my crewmates, was this looks just like an IMAX movie. Because <laughs> it's about the only film format that does justice to the view. Yeah. So, um, so between the IMAX movies I saw and the people that I met, and then of course being encouraged and wanting to keep flying higher and faster, it all came together. And I applied to the program, and much to my amazement, uh, I got selected, which I didn't expect. It was sort of like winning the lottery in my head. Yep. Those of us who know you and have worked with you aren't surprised at the life you've had. Um, 
because because you're an exceptional person, but also down to earth. Oops, there's a little play on words. Um, <laughs> but it's true. And, and, and it is true. And you haven't gotten ahead of that. As you went through all of these firsts, first class with women at the Air Force Academy, first military woman in space, and many others were, if you weren't the first, you were breaking a lot of ground in new territory for women. Did you think of it that way or did you think of it as individually as a person, I'm doing this, it's not about my gender or was it both? I primarily was trying to do these things because they sounded like a whole lot of fun. And I- Good motivation. I, yeah, I, I, I mean, there's obviously more to it than that, but the more to it than that is I wanted to be a professional engineer. I wanted to do mm. a good job at it. I wanted to make, make my life's work uh, doing that in service to my country. And as it turns out, um, I happened to be first on some things, but that's not why I did them. I didn't do them because awesome. of the gender. I didn't do it because I'd get a chance to be first. I did it because it sounded like a lot of fun. And timing is everything, right, Fig? I yep, mean, absolutely. The doors opened about the time I was ready to step through them. And um, and if it turned out that I happened to be at the first at something, that was to me just a massive coincidence. Well, you, you made the most of it. Um, I have to ask you, as an engineer, do you have a slide rule back on your shelves that we see behind you? Because my dad was a chemist and my sisters were techies and we had a Facebook conversation about slide rules, which I could never use. But do you? Uh, you know, they quit issuing those to the Air Force Academy cadets the year before I got there. So oh, does that I don't have a slide rule. I never learned yeah. how to use one. I do have an abacus around here somewhere. <laughs> but um, but yeah, they uh, they gave us a very expensive little calculator that could add, subtract. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that was I bet it, was, it. it had a small nuclear reactor in it. So <laughs> I'm going to leave a minute uh, or two at the end to talk about your current figment. But before we do that, um, I want to talk about something that was, an, I think, equals the uh, accomplishments you made as a flight test engineer and astronaut. And that's your return to the Air Force, because astronauts who are Air Force officers really leave the Air Force. You know, they're off doing NASA things, and most of them never come back, right? That's I mean, true. Don't, you look at the yeah, data. most of them do not come back. Right. Got a picture of you as a three star, as the 14th Air Force commander. Um, Yikes. And, and uh, you came back as a colonel. Uh, when I met you at Space Command and then we're a wing commander and did a bunch of other different general officer officer jobs. And um, you were a great colonel and I think a, a really fine general. And I don't say that about everybody. Once, you know, we have a little bit of hubris, if you will, about that. How, how was it to be out of the Air Force for so long as an astronaut and come back in in a senior and very responsible leadership role? Uh, well, first of all, all the acronyms have changed. So, <laughs> and the uniforms looked like they were a little different. And, yeah, um, sure they were. and the, the whole Air Force had reorganized uh, oh, yeah, you in missed the early that. 90s. And I yeah. left to go to NASA in 1990. So, they changed everything, folks, from street addresses to regulation numbers. I, <laughs> you have to have lived this to know how different the Air Force was when she came back. Yeah, but I knew when I went to go to NASA that I would come back to the Air Force. I, I just knew that I would do that because the Air Force mm -hmm. was my DNA. And I have yeah, to get Truly. Yeah. yeah. So I have to, yeah, exactly, uh, dad being in the background there. So I had yep. to... Um, give so much credit to the people around me who recognized that I was um, swimming underneath all the things that changed mm -hmm. while I was gone. But uh, people were so gracious. People never minded my dumb questions. They never minded helping me remember what side of the uniform to put my name tag. Because uh, at NASA, we only wear civilian clothes. We don't wear uniforms. So I, I uh, and I had a lot of, um, very, very supportive people, you included, Fig, who Thanks. recognized, you know, what situation I was in and was perfectly willing to help me 
work through all that. And, and of course, what the Air Force did in their great wisdom was they put me in the part of the space program that involved understanding satellites. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly insightful of the Air Force to do that because I had been a satellite. And so I <laughs> really intuitively fit in well with the mission area that they put me into, um, which we yeah. would we called space control back then. Yep. And so I, I'm forever grateful to, for the Air Force for recognizing that that's where my real value was, was to help with that part of the mission. Well, I think your real value was you were an outstanding leader and you did the right thing for both mission and people. And we saw that in you. And so I'm glad you, glad you always planned to come back and did. And now I want to make sure that we give you a chance to talk about what your current figment is in the, in your this iteration of your professional and personal life. Yes, I, I have to talk about the fact that um, all those years I was doing everything you've described. Mm -hmm. uh, I missed out on so much with the family. So when I retired, I said, I'm going to move back near my parents and I'm going to be there for them however long it needs to be. And that mm -hmm. was seven plus years ago and they're still with us. So I, Amen. I say I my, my parents, my dad, he's 90 now. He still tells flying stories big. Uh, Perfect, I have a future. I, <laughs> I secretly record with my iPhone when he gets on a roll. So oh, I have wow. those stories. And, uh, and as long as they're around, that's, that's really my, my my priority right now is to make sure that whatever it is they need, I'm there to get it for them. Are they proud of you at all? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. What a, what a oh, blessing gosh. for, it, for the airmen. Dad, and by the way, yeah. He, he and, my daddy uh, tell you all about me, just even if you're a perfect sure. stranger. So. I'd love to hear it. And, uh, and my folks uh, sadly uh, passed away before much of my unexpected success and i wish they could share it i'm sure they do from above even above where you were above so and your dad by the way was a rescue helicopter pilot in vietnam the most dangerous and selfless side of flying in the vietnam war and yes and you're right it's in your dna and i'm so thankful uh that we got a chance to share with folks i know you've inspired and entertained and I hope you'll get you'll get out to Hawaii now that things are getting normal and visit the Rollies. Uh, Alejandra and I will host you because uh, I can afford it with with Ross's money from golf. <laughs> and that's my story. And we look forward to seeing you. I thank you for everything you've done for our country and for the world, really, Susan. Aloha. Well, thank you, too, Fig, for everything you've done. Um, it, it's been marvelous talking with you today and, and this like, is the great thing you're doing. Thank you. It's a lot of fun and we'll do it again next week, folks. And uh, make sure you click like or share or whatever it is we do in the digital world and send me any ideas that you might have on our, uh, on our topics. Aloha and mahalo. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye.